Hey, welcome to my kitchen. Today we're going to do our second installment of five meals for beginner cooks. Today we're going to learn how to cook a meal that's one of my personal favorites. I had it in a restaurant hmm, a couple years ago and just fell in love with it. And it turns out it's real easy to make. Beef short ribs. We're going to cook these things with a style called braising. We're going to get fancy because we're going to use red wine. And when you learn how to make this dish, it's going to wow everybody you know. Okay, so as you can see, I've got all my ingredients together. Uh, we have, of course, our short ribs, some baby portobello mushrooms, about a half a pound of fresh tomatoes, some baby carrots. You can use real carrots if you feel like peeling them. A couple sprigs of rosemary out of my garden, three celery stalks, and about four spring onions. We also have about a cup of red wine, two cans of beef broth, and of course, I got my beer. Tomatoes. It's one of those things a lot of home cooks avoid because they're hard to cut. Or are they? So what I have here is of course my tomato and two knives. Other than the size, they really don't seem that much different. But this one here hasn't been sharpened in quite some time. It's gotten quite dull. So let's demonstrate what most people's knives look like when trying to cut a tomato. We're going to slice it. Now, as you can see, this tomato barely got any indentation on it. So a lot of home cooks, they push on it. Oh man, look at that. It just smushes the tomato. Look at how messed up that looks. That's no good. A sharp knife on the other hand, you don't even have to put any weight on it. You just slide it back and forth and it bites right into the tomato. That's why we keep our knives sharp, kids. All right, so now that I got my tomatoes chopped up, we can move on to another knife technique, chopping. So the next thing I'm going to do is chop up this celery. Uh, first of all, we want to cut off the tops where all the leaves are and the bottoms where it's all white. Then we're going to chop, 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 chop. Well, I'm just a home cook. I can't do that turbo knife that you see on Iron Chef. But I'm going to teach you how to cut pretty fast anyway. Have you ever noticed how most knives have a rounded blade? There's a reason for that. If you put the tip down, you'll notice they rock. This is the trick to cutting fast. One of the other tricks, stacking. Do as many things at once as you can. So what we're going to do, we're going to line up our celery stalks here. We're just going to rock the knife up, just like a lever, and we're just going to keep doing this motion and slowly feed it in like a really low budget death trap for James Bond. So here we go. And that's about the easiest way to chop. Again, Make sure you have a sharp knife. So now I got everything chopped up. Onions, celery, carrots. If you ever watch these cooking shows, a lot of the chefs will tell you, you want to try and get everything as close to the same size when you're cutting it as possible. Well, I disagree with that. You see, we got this big chunk, this little chunk. No real consistency, but you know what? That tells the people that eat my food, it was made by a human being, not a machine. Tell you what, all that chopping sure takes a lot out of a guy. Now, if you don't have beer at home to recharge yourself with, you can go ahead and buy frozen vegetables. You can usually get them chopped already. Uh, I would not do the canned versions of the chopped vegetables just because they soak them and they get really soggy and a lot of the flavors are already in the liquid. We want this flavor to come out in the sauce we're going to make. So, fresh chopped or frozen, that's the way to go. Man, I really need more of this. Now, if you caught the last installment, we mentioned searing meat to keep the juices in. We're definitely going to want to do that here. We're working with a red meat that's not very fatty. You know, it has a little bit of fat that will cook down into juice, but for the most part, it's pretty lean. And if we cook all that juice out of the meat, it's going to be dry and nasty. Fortunately, we have the culinary world's duct tape, also known as flour. Now, before we add flour, we want to season the meat. So we're going to hit it with a little salt and pepper. Now I like using the salt grater just because you get bigger crystals of salt on there so you actually don't need as much salt. When that big crystal hits your tongue, your tongue's like, whoa, salt. And you know, if it feels like there's more salt, your brain thinks there's more salt and you get away with less salt. So that's win, 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 win. And flip that over. We want to make sure we get both sides because apparently 
people like their food to taste good on both sides. Weird, huh? All right, so the next thing we're gonna do, we're just gonna toss this in a bowl here. We're gonna get our flour. And I'm a firm believer in saving dishes, so I'm just gonna kinda pour this right on the meat. No need to measure. We're just gonna kinda shake it around, get a nice even coat. You don't want very much of the red meat showing through, and that's how you know you've got a nice coat. So your meat's gonna look kinda like this when you're done. Now what the flour is gonna do when we sear it, is it's kinda bake like almost a quasi bread barrier, and that'll serve two purposes. It'll give the outside of the meat even more strength to hold the juice in, and when we get our sauce prepared, it'll be like bread and it'll just soak up the flavor. How's that for awesome? Now because I have a big family, I'm making a pretty big batch of this stuff. As you can see, I've got a lot of meat here and we're going to go ahead and sear it, but because I have so much, it's not going to fit in the pan all at once. That's okay. We'll do it in a couple batches and it'll all turn out fine. So we have our Dutch oven here and I've got some extra virgin olive oil in it. We're going to get this really, really hot before we throw our meat in. We want to make sure that when our meat hits that, it sears instantly. Now, the reason I use extra virgin olive oil, aside from health benefits, it does have a little bit more of a flavor to it than other oils. And what that's going to do is it's going to make our meat just that much more savory. Now while we're waiting for our oil to heat up, it's a great time to refuel. Now if everybody was paying attention to the last installment, we can make sure that it's done just by putting a wooden spoon or a chopstick in. See how it's bubbling? Yep, it's ready to cook. So we're going to take our meat just a couple pieces at a time, put it in there. You can hear that nice little sizzle. And I think I'll be able to fit about four at a time in there. And we're just going to go ahead and let that cook. Give it about four minutes on each side. And that's all four sides, by the way. Don't just flip it. You want to make sure that that stuff gets seared all around. All right, we're looking good down here. It's just about ready to take out and get our next batch on. Yeah, I'm going to show you what this looks like here. Look at that, nice and crispy on the outside, really dark. It's going to be nice and red on the inside still. And that's a good thing, because we're going to be cooking this for about two hours after we're done this. Alright, so the last of our meat is just finishing up here. And you'll notice in the bottom of the pan we've got quite a nice brown, oily, beef brothy looking liquid forming here. That's going to be the first layer of our flavor sauce. And the next layer is going to come from all our vegetables. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to throw all our vegetables in. Starting with our tomatoes. Woo! And we'll get everything else in here. I want to make a mess all over my countertop. You don't see Gordon Ramsay throwing food everywhere, but that's how I roll. And we'll hit it with just a small handful of these baby bella mushrooms. We don't need, well, maybe a bit more than a small handful. We don't need too much. They got like such a meaty flavor that they're going to like shrink, and all the juices from the mushrooms are going to mix in. And for the most part, all the stuff that's in the pot right now, we're not even actually going to eat. It's just going to be the base of our sauce. We're basically making a vegetable beef stock type thing right now. So we want to get all these flavors cooked into the oil we have before we get our sauce going. Now all my vegetables are cooking down, I'm just going to take another little opportunity to refuel. Now it's hard to see right now, but what we're looking for is the uh, white part of our spring onions to just be starting to turn brown. That means that they're just starting to caramelize. We don't want to cook them much more beyond that or they will burn. And since we're about there now, what we're going to do is we are going to put our meat back in right on top of this vegetable mix. Load that sucker up. Look at how good this meat looks too. You'd never know that it was pink in the middle right now. But that's what we want. Nice half cooked meat. And then we're going to hit it with the red wine. Now when you're doing alcohol, don't lean over your pot and breathe because that alcohol is going to evaporate. 
And unless you got a really bad cold, you probably don't want to be breathing in pure alcohol vapor. Then again, you might. Of course, if you came prepared, you don't need to breathe alcohol. You're set. Our pot's been boiling for almost three minutes now and the smell of the wine is starting to let up so it's time to add our beef broth. Now while that's boiling I'm going to take a big scoop of flour and just throw it in my can. Again saving dishes and then I'm going to put some cold water in here and stir it all up. And then I'm going to very slowly pour this in. I don't want to pour it too fast just because I want to make sure there's no chunks of flour in there. And that's going to help our sauce thicken up a little bit as it cooks. We'll go ahead and stir that in. And while we're at it, we'll just dump liquid all over the stove because, again, that's how I roll. Since our liquid's boiling, we're going to go ahead and do the last part. That's throwing in our fresh rosemary. If you don't have fresh rosemary, you can use the dried stuff, but it's a pain in the butt to get out of the sauce, so try and get the good stuff. We're also going to turn this down to a simmer now and our oven is preheating to 350 degrees. So as soon as our oven is preheated, we're gonna take it off the simmer, we're gonna put it in the oven, we're gonna set the timer for two and a half hours, and we will be back when everything's cooked. There we go. Now, the traditional way to serve this dish is with mashed potatoes. That way you can put the sauce on the potatoes and it's just like a really awesome gravy. And I just happen to have a super secret family recipe for mashed potatoes. It's been in my family for one generation. You ready for this? That's right. Idahoan Real Premium Mashed Potatoes in the Big Red Box. Found at your local Sam's Club. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's not a secret recipe. Anybody can use instant mashed potatoes. You're wrong. You need to be a Sam's Club member, damn it, because these aren't just normal potato flakes. Check this out. These suckers are big old chunks of real dehydrated potato. And that saves a lot of time, but it tastes just like homemade. So take that, naysayers. All right, so it's finally done. What we're going to do here is we're going to take some tongs, because this is really hot, and we're just going to pull out all the meat, set it aside. Alright, now that we've got our meat out, we're going to save a little time here. We're just going to pour everything into a strainer. And what we want to do is get all these chunky vegetables and herbs and whatnot out of our sauce. So we'll just give it a little shake, drain it all out into a nice bowl. And this sauce is basically going to work like a gravy. You'll put it over top of your meat and your potatoes, and you will have the most awesomest, yummiest beef short rib meal you've ever made because it's probably the first time you've ever made it. <laughs> All right, after much patient waiting and rehydrating, dinner is done and served. Don't that look good? I'm Josh Tuttle, and I cook at home.